Scenes in which the patient or bystanders are prone to sudden changes in behavior put yourself at risk for violence and personal injury. All right. If the scene is critical that you don't antagonize the patrons, a routine question or comment can easily be misunderstood by someone who's inebriated, patient, or bystander and lead to violent confrontation. Have your partner stand and survey the patrons at all times. Don't turn your back on the people in the bar. Don't reply to verbal threats, but never ignore them either. It takes only an instant for verbal abuse to turn into physical assault. Your uniform or other emergency lights on the ambulance may be misinterpreted as the police by vehicle occupants who may be intoxicated on alcohol or other drugs. So park your ambulance at least one car length behind the vehicle. Park with your wheels turned slightly to the left so that if you must back up, you won't go any deeper into the shoulder of the road. Okay, align your headlights in the middle of the trunk and turn them to the high beam. Try to reflect your beams off the rear view mirror, illuminating the car's interior and making your approach more difficult for the occupants of the car to see. While you're still in the ambulance, write down the license number of the vehicle and leave it on the radio, leave it at the radio. Note how many people are in the car, which position they're in. Okay, if the driver's apparent condition can be seen. Okay, if they have tinted windows, be more cautious. As you approach the vehicle, be alert to the possibility of other unseen occupants. Check to see whether the trunk is locked and look at the rear seat and the floor as you pass. Have your partner open the passenger door a split second before you open the driver's door. If you are alone, wait for help to arrive. Keep behind the center post, carry an object such as a re um, such as a report book or a bag that you can throw at the occupant's face if they become violent. If you must retreat, immediately get into your vehicle and back up rapidly. Move at least 100 to 150 yards to clear the killing zone. Emergency scenes can also expose the patient to the curiosity of public. A situation may find highly stressful. The MT, you have to be keen of awareness and so factors affect the patient and be prepared to do whatever is necessary to change them to ensure the patient's safety and comfort. If you are unable to control the scene to make it safe for the patient, move the patient quickly to a safer environment such as the back of the ambulance. Okay, your attention must be directed toward the patient. However, if you have a large crowd, that's part of a scene and making sure that the bystanders are safe also is one of your responsibilities during scene size up. So if hazards to the bystanders can't be minimized or eliminated, remove the bystanders from the scene. In case of spills, leaks, fires, or heavy smoke, they must be kept back using roadblocks, detours, police lines, public address systems advising bystanders of the risk and for them to stay away. All right, the crowd is part of a scene and making sure the bystanders are safe is one of your responsibilities during the scene size up. Okay, if hazards to the bystanders can't be minimized or eliminated, remove the bystanders from the scene. Providing light. Make it a point to have a good flashlight. Keep it handy day and night. Move furniture that interferes with access to the patient. Okay. In a, in a residence, despite the emergency, you are a guest in the home and should demonstrate a proper level of respect towards the owners and occupants. You may need to move the patient to an area more conductive to patient care. Attempting to resuscitate a patient in a cramped bathroom would generally make little sense when by moving the patient five feet to the bedroom, you would have plenty of space in which to work. Whenever an injured is sorry, whenever an injury is suspected, the patient can be properly immobilized to a backboard before moving is attempted. Okay? In operating outdoors, try to position the ambulance in such a way that the crowd won't get between you, the patient and the ambulance. When working indoors, consider asking bystanders to keep all doors along the route to the ambulance open and don't allow yourself to be cornered. Stay calm. Use tact and dip use tact and diplomacy. Compassionate, understanding tone may produce more positive results than a harsh, demanding one. Okay, pre-hospital care involves working with both people and a variety of ages, races, religions, and backgrounds. So many people have all ways of different life, all cultures, so you have to be sure that you're not going to um, 
try to persuade them in a way that's different from yours. Not only do you need to be alert to yourself, but you also need to be alert to your partners, your patient, and your surroundings. And be compassionate towards the people that you have been called on to serve. Scene size up is a very dynamic process and constantly ever evolving. So EMS personnel must continuously assess the emergency scene for unusual characteristics such as sounds, smells, or things that look weird or odd. So the key to remaining safe is to always remain vigilant. When at the scene, always maintain situational awareness. You need to shift your attention to patient assessment and management once you have entered the scene and deemed it safe. However, you still need to be aware of all aspects of the scene around you. After the scene, safety has been ensured. The next step in the scene size up is determining the nature of the patient's problem that brought you to the scene. The two basic categories of problems are trauma and medical. Which category a patient falls into will determine how you proceed with the continuing assessment and treatment of the patient. In a pre-hospital care, the EMT first looks for evidence of an injury. If the possibility of the injury is ruled out, the EMT can assume that this is a medical call. As always, though, you should remain open-minded and flexible as you try to determine the nature of the problem. Sometimes a patient won't fit neatly into one category or the other. For example, you may continue a diabetic suffering from an altered mental status from taking too much insulin who has fallen down a flight of stairs. So this patient is suffering from both trauma and a medical condition. The index of suspicion is the degree of your anticipation that the patient has been injured or has been injured in a specific way. So based on your knowledge that certain mechanisms usually produce certain types of injuries, the mechanism of injury provides only a degree of suspicion of the types of injuries. It doesn't provide any indication of the actual injuries or condition. Only physical examination can be used to determine the actual injuries. Identification of the MOI in a patient may begin with the dispatch information. So dispatch to an automobile crash, a shooting, a fall, or a stabbing will provide some sort of preliminary information as what you can expect when you get on scene. However, keep in mind that it's always ever-changing, so by the time you get there, it could be something different. So scene characteristics provide clues about what forces were applied to the body and the possible patterns of injury that may have resulted. Identification of a mechanism of injury in a trauma patient may begin with the dispatch information. Dispatch to a fall, looking at the scene. Did they fall a great distance? Did they fall onto a hard surface? Did they fall onto a soft surface? When they fell 20 feet, did they hit anything along the way causing other additional injuries aside from the impact? Was there anything that slowed the velocity of the patient down prior to impact on the concrete? Once you arrive on the scene, however, it is necessary to take a much closer look at the scene characteristics as damage to the automobile, the use of restraint devices, seat belts, the distance that the patient may have fallen, the type of surface the patient fell on, such as grass, carpet, concrete, okay, or the caliber of the gun the patient was shot with. Was it a high velocity round? Was it a low velocity round? Was it point blank? Was it from a great distance? Was it a 9mm versus a 7.62? All right, was it a 22? Was it a 38? Okay, these types of weapons are going to cause different types of cavitation. Look for evidence of a fall when arriving on scene. Fall on ladders, collapsed scaffolding, ropes in a tree or on buildings, trees in immediate proximity of the patient, stairs. Okay, blunt forces applied to the body produce widespread injury to organs, bones, muscles, nerves, and blood vessels. These types of collisions of point of impact to the vehicle commonly dictate the types of injuries to expect. So study the vehicle carefully and, if possible, identify this information. When approaching the scene of a motor vehicle crash, look for evidence of both external impact to the vehicle from outside force and internal impact to the vehicle caused by the patient's body. You should quickly walk around all sides of the vehicle to identify all the points of impact. You should walk around the vehicle, conduct a close inspection of the passenger compartment, and look for signs of impact that correlate with specific types of injuries, such as chest injury with a deformed steering wheel, okay, or a head injury with a spiderweb windshield. 
seatbelt injuries with a consistent seat belted in patient. Deployment of a driver or front seat passenger airbag may produce an impact mark that resembles what would be made of the patient's head contacting the windshield. Okay, in this case, determine whether the safety belt restraint system was used or examine the head for evidence of trauma. Ejection from the vehicle can be can produce significant blunt force trauma and even penetrating trauma. So patients often die not from the ejection itself, but from the car rolling on top of them or them being impaled with something that they were injected onto or impaled with something that they got in, impaled with on their way through the windshield. The death or significant injury of one passenger should cause you to be suspect significant injury to the other passengers. Motor vehicle crashes produce some of the most lethal mechanisms of injury. Blunt forces applied to the body produce widespread injuries to the organs, to the bones, tearing of the muscles and nerves, and blood vessels. So try to determine and document the type of impact involved, whether it was a lateral, a front end, a rear, a rollover. All right, head-on collisions, the rider is propelled forward off the motorcycle, for instance. An angular impact, the rider strikes an object. Ejection, the rider is thrown from the motorcycle and impacts the ground. The object involved in the collision, or both. Laying the bike down versus being thrown from the bike. Okay, the rider purposely lays the bike down on its side to avoid another potentially more serious impact. So their patterns of injury are going to be consistent with road rash. Okay, torn clothing. Snowmobiles, also known as uh, all-terrain vehicles, are commonly operated on uneven terrain a factor that contributes to a lot of rollovers. So crush type injuries are common. Snowmobiles can travel at high speed producing very severe impact upon collision with trees, rocks, vehicles. All right. It can be closed lined. In these injuries, a rider is pulled off the vehicle by a low branch, wire, rope, or other low hanging object causing severe trauma to the neck and the airway. So whenever you receive a report of a shooting or a stabbing at the scene of a call, it's necessary to expose and assess the patient's body. Remember, expose or what we call get them trauma naked. Okay. With an unresponsive patient, completely expose them and look for penetrating injury, whether or not blood is visible at the scene of or around the body. Be sure to log roll the patient to inspect the posterior or the back for any open wounds also. So when you're getting the patient trauma naked, you're looking for that initial entry wound to the anterior part of the body and then you're going to roll them to look for an exit wound. Heavy coats, dark clothing, poor lighting, dark environments, or dark hair can hide blood very well. So you got to make sure you look very, very well. In order to do that, you've got to get them naked, get them trauma naked. Okay. Whenever you receive reports of a shooting or stabbing at the scene of a call, it's necessary to expose them, confirm or rule out a stabbing or a gunshot wound. Explosions are another source of trauma. Gas, fireworks, natural gas, propane, an acetylene torch, grain dust and grain elevators. Criminal intent are common causes of explosions. Look for injuries caused by the pressure wave exposed associated with the blast by flying debris, by the collision that results when a patient propelled from the blast contacts the ground or other objects. If a patient who's not injured but is suffering from a medical condition, you will begin to determine the nature of illness during your scene size up. So after you arrive at the scene, you must determine the reason that you were called. Simply ask patient, family members, or other bystanders an open-ended question, such as what seems to be the problem today. So what had you call EMS today? Could provide you with exact nature of illness. The patient or their family may try to mislead you or the <clears throat> or the cloud to reveal to real nature of the illness. They're going to try to cloud their answer. Oh, kind of be vague, paint a lot of pretty picture, but in fact, they're trying to hide the actual reason. For example, to hide the use of drugs, such as heroin, crack, cocaine, or illegal use of prescription drugs. Okay. Inspect the scene for clues about the illness. Look for prescription and non-prescription medications, drugs, drug paraphernalia, alcohol, all right, and other pertinent clues. Home oxygen equipment may indicate a pre-existing respiratory disease or cardiac condition. 
Okay, the physical position and condition of the patient may provide information about the illness. For instance, a tripod position, sitting up and leaning forward, may indicate respiratory distress or cardiac compromise. Environmental conditions may provide clues to the nature of the illness. Extreme cold, wet and cold clothing, or a patient found outdoors in cool weather should suggest the possibility of hypothermia. A hot and humid environment, especially if the patient was playing a sport or performing some other strenuous activity, should suggest a possible heat emergency. The last major element of the scene size up that we need to worry about is determining the total number of patients. Sometimes this is simple, as in the case of a single responsive patient who has called for help because of chest pain. At other times, in the case of a multiple vehicle collision during a nighttime snowstorm, or a suspected carbon monoxide poisoning in a multifamily dwelling, it is the more complicated situation. So if, after studying the scene, you determine that there are more patients than your unit can effectively handle, initiate the call okay, for extra help. If your number of patients surpasses your resources at an individual ambulance, begin triage, prioritization of victims. Follow your local protocols for triage. All right. It is critical to be aware of all patients at the scene, and at times this may be obvious, but the EMT must always be alert to the possibility of multiple patients, so try to call for additional assistance before making contact with the patients. It's better to have them on the way and cancel them to need them and not have them on the way at all. So a scene size up, okay? Ensure safety of those at the scene. Ultimately, yours and your partner's safety is first. Patient safety and bystanders is next. Okay? Determine the nature of the problem or mechanism of injury. Do I need C-spine if this is trauma? If so, you might want to have somebody hold C-spine. Okay? How many patients do I have? Do I need additional resources? Do I have my PPE on? Do I have my BSI on? And if so, is what I have on, is it sufficient for the call? Okay? Be aware, this is utmost priority, okay? You have to be safe in order to treat. If you get hurt, you can't treat. So always keep that in mind.